The longer I live, the more beautiful life becomes. If you foolishly ignore beauty, then you will soon find yourself without it, and your life will be impoverished. But if you invest in beauty, it will remain with you all the days of your life. So said Frank Lloyd Wright. So, what is beauty to you? Where do you find it? Are you foolishly ignoring it? And that is examined in tonight's story. Another from Dr. Crippen's vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. So, without further delay, it's once again time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. 10th of October, 2019. Today was a good day. Recently, all the diary entries were either gloomy, angry, or downright desperate, but not today. I saw my mom walk again. Oh, just the sight of her shaking, grasping for balance as she covers the distance between her hospital bed to the clothes hanger no more than a meter away. It brought tears to my eyes. It actually made me cry like the neighbor's baby in the middle of the night. It was genuinely just so amazing. Two weeks ago, I really thought I'd lost her. Well, she didn't pick up the phone the whole day, and this thought, this thought that something bad had happened to her just crossed my mind. When this vicious, pulsating image of her dying out, whispering for help while reaching out for the phone that was ringing, ringing my name on the display just a few centimeters away, but impossibly out of range of her paralyzed hands. When all this was going on in the back of my mind, slowly materializing with every failed call. Every time I would press the green icon and the line would beep relentlessly, lifelessly. I would feel the rushing fear, the chills. As I was putting down my phone, the nightmare of her casket going down into the cold ground was gradually seeping into reality. First time I tried dialing her was at noon, during my lunch break. Maybe she was at the shop and didn't hear. One hour later, still nothing. Each and every subsequent try became incrementally closer to the previous one. By 20 to 3, the display read 11 failed calls and I was properly scared. She was getting old and, I know, all people forget and oftentimes put their phones in places they can't hear them, but this is mum. No, not her. So, I just stood up and left the office. Gary protested, but, you know, fuck Gary. It seems I won't be seeing his stupid face much in the future anyway. I had to go. If I waited until five, she'd be stuck in rush hour, and if not mother, then I'd be the one having a heart attack. Thankfully, she lives close to my workplace. The trip is just 10 to 13 minutes in normal circumstances. Run two red lights and drive well over the limit, it becomes more like four. I saw at least two cameras flash at me, but oh, my wallet's ready. As I got into her building, everything was quiet. There were no ambulances, no worried neighbours. Even her best friend, old Manny Talara, even she wasn't out there in the lobby, gossiping about how much my love life sucks. I think my misfortunes with Tina really amused her. Gave her some sort of sick kick. But, well... Recently, I've been a fan of the F-word, so F her, too. I won't be hearing her breaking, screechy, and unbearably annoying voice after I go to China. I pressed the elevator button, but almost immediately realized it's ancient and slow, so instead I rushed up the stairs to the fourth floor. I flew up, and without as much as a breath, I sprinted directly to my mum's door, which was at the far end of the corridor. I slammed my hand on the bell, and then I started hammering on the door with my fist. Mother! I shouted, much like a madman, as I was hoping she opened the door with perplexed eyes and one of her trademark dishes sizzling in a pot she held in her hands, oblivious to the worry she'd made me experience. My own hand froze, mid-motion, as I focused my senses, flooding my ears with blood, hoping for a sign that indeed she was coming, that she was all right. In that moment, all I could hear was the most terrible sound of all. Nothingness. Complete 
and suffocating silence. In that instance, it seemed even the multitude of cars jammed like sardines in a can outside didn't make as much as a squeal or a clank. No, in that very moment, I felt truly alone in this world. My hands were cold, and they were trembling in a way I didn't think possible. I was panicking, out of breath and out of control. It took me what seemed like forever to thread the spare key into the lock. As the mechanism turned, the most terrible images started going through my mind. I could see my mother, dead on the floor, abundant foam escaping her purple, lifeless lips, her body coloured in a way that no living human is. In my vision, she looked just like poor old Billy who died in the parking lot two years ago. I feared the worst. As I slammed the door open, I resumed shouting, but again, no response. Something was definitely wrong with Mother, with what I can describe as the most sickening and nauseating anticipation I've ever felt. I went from room to room, searching for the one person I genuinely love in this world. First was the living room, but there was nobody there. Next was her favourite place in the house a sparkling new kitchen that I got her for a 60th anniversary. It did cost a pretty penny, but the smile on her face was so wide and so bright, truly priceless, giving a higher purpose to putting up with Gary, the self-righteous asshole. She wasn't there. I gave a sigh of relief in a momentary lapse of logic. She was somewhere in the apartment and I had to find her to help her. Hoping it's not too late, I rush towards the bedroom, passing by the door of the bathroom. It was this very same instance in time that my soul was ripped, cut to pieces by the sight my eyes had seen. My mother. She was there. Her head was resting on the floor and her body was half naked. Blue hue had spread throughout her skin. I collapsed, scrambling to make sense of what was there before me, facing, <laughs> anticipating, putting my finger on her neck and feeling the faint, resonating pulse of her old, caring heart that had spent far too many beats in my name, for my sake. My whole being was sinking into a deep, endless hole as I reached out towards her. What if there was nothing? What if? That's the scariest thing about it at all about death. What if oh, this was it? No goodbyes, no time to settle what's left behind. If, when I die, I want to at least let people know that I was thinking about them in the end. What few words crossed my mind before all the words ceased to be, before I was no more. In that terrible moment of horrible expectations, I felt the one and only thing that could once more bring warmth back to the world. I felt her heart, barely beating through the coldness of her skin. Oh, incredible relief, unfounded exultation. Feelings came to me that I never, ever felt before. I hugged her, giving her some of my own body heat, careful not to push too hard and worsen any fracture she might have. Shaking myself, I called emergency and through tears explained to them the situation. I shouted that they needed to hurry. So many times the operator must still be hearing my voice in her nightmares. The ambulance came in what they claimed were a mere six minutes, but to me it felt like years. I recalled, as I was a child, and what me and mum would do together. I remembered how happy she was when I held my master's degree in my hand. I really wanted her to stay with me. The paramedics arrived. They went through their checklists. And I understood nothing. Is she okay? What's going on? Is she okay? I kept on repeating like a broken radio stuck on the last bit of the cassette, hopelessly going in a loop. They didn't reply. They were too busy checking her vitals, administering a shot and putting her on a stretcher. I was getting desperate, 
confused and properly irritated. I was just about to snap, when the more senior of the two paramedics turned to me and explained the situation. She's hypothermic, but that's likely because she fainted and spent around two hours in this state. The underlying cause of the seizure is currently unknown. There's evidence of trauma on her back, and her left hand might be broken. Again, this is most likely a result of the fall, but not the cause. We don't have the equipment here to tell you more. She needs to go to hospital ASAP. This was so unbelievable, and yet happening. I could well understand the words the doctor was saying, but he was so to the point and talking about how my mother had broken her arm, as if it was such a matter-of-fact thing. I just didn't know what to say. Just, I knew I would do whatever it would take to make her well again. What's the best place you can take her to? I inquired, knowing full well her insurance wouldn't cover anything besides the neighborhood clinic. Then again, I'm pretty sure she'd have better chances of surviving if we just let her stay on the floor rather than taking her there. Oh, that would be St. Anna, he stated, without as much as a glint of hesitation in his eyes. Following that were twenty sleepless hours which I spent on a bench in the hospital, craving and only haphazardly receiving information about whatever was going on with Mum. As the new day dawned, so did a sliver of hope. The chief of the cardiology ward gracing me with his presence. He explained to me in layman's terms that her arteries were damaged and they had to insert stents in them to keep the blood flowing properly. This was all black magic to me, but I rejoiced at the part where he said she'd live and recover. I didn't manage to write a diary entry that day, and as Mum really seems to be doing well, I finally mustered the courage to write about the events that transpired. It all gives Black Friday a whole new meaning, honestly. Fingers crossed, I think the worst part is over. Oh, and so back to today. Gary was his usual self, that is, a cock. He isn't taking well the fact I got chosen to move to the new office in China, but senior staff deemed he was, I quote, irreplaceable. So yeah, you are stuck, buddy. I hope you rot here and your fat wife keeps on beating you at night. Oh, and speaking about wives, things with Tina are just unbearable at this point. We have arguments every day, even when we don't actually see each other. The whole move to Beijing literally takes all my time and attention, and after I'm done with it, well, then we just never see each other again and maybe a divorce from a distance. Yeah, I know I'm a coward for thinking this, but I really don't want to deal with her right now. I still have to sell my car, get a truckload of papers prepared, and deposit it all over town. Uh, obviously, my mum requires a lot of attention too. Not that I blame her or anything, just that it's all too much for me right now. I need a break. hope they have nice places in China. I don't think I'll be getting the chance to even get a good night's sleep until I land there. Definitely not if Tina continues on screeching all the damn time. I make it a point to never come home before ten, just to avoid as much of her as possible. I had to spend more than an hour at a gas station today, but it beats coming back. Oh, I swear, I feel like she'll knife me in my sleep one of these nights. Just the way she looks at me, there's this intense hatred oozing out. I think... Oh, I think she knows what I did. She must. There's not much I can do right now, though. Everything, all my documents, my PC and my bed are in the house we share. And she should be happy she'll get to keep it after I'm gone. That's enough, right? I mean, I'm not saying I'm a gentleman or whatever, but at the end of the day, our relationship is over. And she gets a house for bearing with my sorry ass. People settle for less. Anyway, I'm dead tired. This will be it for today. Oh, I hope tomorrow goes by fast. 11th of October, 2019. 
So, um, something funny happened. As today was Friday, I had to go to the Higher Education Degree Administration because it turns out they have a 10-day period to process requests. So, um, well, if I'm to fly to Asia the week after next, I really had to make sure my diploma would be verified by that. I go there. As usual, there's a sizable queue and having no choice whatsoever, I take my place at the back. Little by little, we move like rats in a lab. The white light on the ceiling buzzes monotonously, much like a hundred bees slowly banging their bodies into the glass, dying out in a noisy mess. Step, and then another. But not for long, as the lady at the desk stands up to take a break, the second one within the hour. I notice the very intrusive smell of sweat coming from this guy three people in front of me. Ugh, it makes the air heavy and elusive. I think how much I hate people like him. People who not only have the indecency to skip a bath, but at the same time are arrogant enough to stand in the queue. In my queue. God. Judging by the balding top of his head, he was probably well in his forties. Most likely married. Well, his wife must be happy he won't ever cheat on her. Oh, even a donkey would run away from that stench. My annoyance soon grew into repulsion, and then into scorn. My hands curled into fists. My mind was filled with ideas. Images of me doing things to that guy. Things I uh, dare not say. My breath became heavier. I started to tremble. I was excited and then... I was light. My vision failed me. My legs no longer having the strength to prop my body up. and I succumbed to an unexpected, nauseating fall. Someone caught me on the way down barely able to prevent my head from hitting the floor. I could hear their voices, the distant yet raucous chanting of the men and women in the hall. Some of them were worried, but I felt, well, most of them were just annoyed. Nobody wanted to deal with a dying man on top of this damn queue. Well, I, I wasn't really dying. Why did I write that? <laughs> Whatever. I guess the chronic lack of sleep is starting to take its toll. I could hear Tina murmur something in the middle of the night yesterday. It woke me up and afterwards I just couldn't will myself back to sleep. I think I'll try the couch tonight. She's giving me those looks right now anyway. I'll just ignore her. She never understood why I write a diary anyway. Hey, if you want to reflect on what you do each day, how come you haven't killed yourself yet? She just said this out of the freaking blue. You know what, Tina? I just can't be bothered at this point. I feel sick and tired out of my mind. So I'm just going to sleep, and hopefully this time around, I won't wake up when you're trying to give me the creeps. 12th of October, 2019. Today was Saturday, and so I could spend some quality time with Mother. The doctor said she's recovering like a young girl, and she certainly looked it. We managed to stroll through the hospital park, and man, she got better at walking than she used to be. Or perhaps well, I just got worse. At some point, though, she said something weird. Son, you should take it a bit easier. I know I caused you a ton of worries, but still, nothing's more important than your own health. No mother wants to bury their own boy. What? I exclaimed, surprised by how, how unexpectedly grim my mother's words were. I mean, look at this huge strand of white hair coming down the side of your head. Oh, you must be under a lot of stress, no? Morbid chills ran down my spine. For the love of God, I swear something strange was going on. I'm barely 30, and I know I haven't been taking the best care of myself. But I did comb my hair before going out. Well, perhaps a couple of white hairs here and there, but a strand? No, that was impossible. My ears got deaf with the rushing adrenaline. Mum was speaking words, but none of them were reaching me. I had to find my way to a mirror. What she was saying couldn't be true, but I also wanted to pretend like nothing was happening. 
Not so long ago, her life was hanging by a thread. I just couldn't trouble her. Sure enough, she proposed we rest on a bench, and I was happy to oblige. I offered I go buy us something from the nearest coffee shop and left her there. I rushed, running to the shop where I hoped I'd find a toilet, one that was bound to have a mirror on the wall. Storming in, I felt embarrassed as people turned their heads towards me, but my vexation was stronger than all else. I had to know. I went to the cashier and asked her if they had a bathroom. She, oh, she looked at me with dread, her own hand trembling on its way to her open mouth. It was as if, it was as if she saw something truly terrifying. What is going on with me? No words escaped her petrified expression, but still, she signed with her quivering eyes towards the right. I wasted no moments. I really had to know. I had to see the extent of the damage. I felt this disgusting metallic taste in my mouth as I opened the door. For an instance, I presumed my cardiovascular system had given up and my blood was gushing all out on the inside. Now, the mirror within sight, each and every breath felt harder, heavier. I had to look, but I was afraid because I knew something was off. Something was really wrong with me. I was sweating profusely. My vision was blurry. I was confused, not knowing what sensation to attribute to the frightened, what to the ailment that had befallen me. I gathered my courage, my courage and my strength, and I looked. Oh, the man in front of me. It just couldn't be me. It wasn't a strand that was white. My whole hair had lost its color, as if I'd bleached it. Even my hairdo it wasn't what I remembered it to be. I looked so old, and my eyes, they were red, I mean, deep crimson red dripping with sanguine tears and fear. I ran out, not caring or able to think about what the people in the cafe considered me to be. In fact, I hoped they saw me as a lunatic, a madman, because, well, then I'd, I'd be fine. Yeah, I'd drink up my meds, stay tucked inside the no-hands jacket and emerge out of it a sane, healthy man. But if they saw what I saw, then... Oh, I just don't know. I tremble at the thought. It terrorizes me ever since. I race towards Mother, a jumbled mess of thoughts and words spinning in my head, vertigo ransacking my afflicted mind. What was I to tell her? What explanation could I provide for the way I looked when I knew nothing myself? I'd paced no more than twenty meters when I heard this bone-rattling crack coming out of my right knee. Debilitating pain and terror followed soon, clenching and grasping at my very core. No, no, I, I couldn't let her see me. I had to somehow manage to find my way back to the car. There, I'd sit and collect myself. There, I'd pick up the phone and call the hospital. They'd take care of Mum. She'd gone through too much and come out on top. I couldn't throw all that away. I was either crazy or I was dying, and I had to protect her from myself. Run! Oh, I had to run before this, what I hope was a fit of madness, overpower my fading conscience. All I needed was to reach my tiny metal box, close myself inside and recover in the safety of its shell. Oh, I always loved my little sporty Nissan, now more than ever. And it was in my sight. Going in, I put the radio on. Three little birds was playing, cushioning my clattering teeth into a halt, easing my breathing. Every little thing's gonna be alright. Kept my soul from shattering, faced with the unknown threat hanging over me. Oh, thank God for Marley, I sighed, regaining most of my composure. Enough so I could ring the reception and make sure Mother would be all right as well. I'm sure she worries about me, 
or how I looked and how I suddenly disappeared. Nevertheless, what could I have done? At least this way the nurses could lull her with some stupid excuse as to why I had to go so unexpectedly. Rather than just having her see my face, my hair, and well, figuring, ascertaining that something was really wrong with her child. What followed thereafter, I actually have little memory of. I felt drunk and dazed. Muscle memory and the back of my brain allying together to bring me home in one piece. So, yeah, now I'm writing this. I was too afraid to look at the mirror. I'm not sure I want to know what horrors it would reveal. And speaking of horrors, Tina is still here. She sits at a chair on the dining table opposite of me. She's awfully quiet today, but there's just something about her. Her eyes are filled with disgust, disdain, and seeing me look like I'm dying, they shine, oh, happiness oozing out of them like pus from gangrenous limbs. The sight of her, it's unbearable, but also there's something about her. I feel she looks better today than usual. Is it because I've seldom seen her happy? Her skin... Her skin looks smoother somehow. The many freckles that adorn her skin from spring to winter are now non-existent. And her wrinkles, etched on her face like the never-ending disapproving grimaces that she has towards me, even they have much receded. Is this all makeup? But then, she is acting weird. There's something that amuses her about me, and about my condition. What's she doing to me? Can my situation be in some way caused by her? But how? It, that's just impossible. It was crazy. Still, I rejoice at that thought. I much prefer I lose my mind than my life. I hope I'm better tomorrow. 13th of October, 2019. Oh, the 13th of October. Truly a cursed day for me. The phone rang earlier on, waking me up even though it was already early afternoon. I struggled to collect myself and pick it up, as everything was spinning before my eyes. The meter that separated me from my mobile device was much like a crevice in between two mountains, an abyss with no end. I only managed to accept the third call, and that was with great pain. My hands were shaking my finger joints cracking under the otherwise banal weight of the light plastic foam. As I answered, there was someone who was calling for the car. My head was spinning, my brain blown to butter by the unbearable migraine that paralyzed my thoughts. The person on the other side of the line, he was talking, but all he said was muffled, muted by the agonizing pain rushing to my ears. We agreed, I think that he comes to take a look at it later on today. Now. He's here now. He stands there, ringing at my doorbell. Tina stays behind me, expecting me to stand up and walk to him, go out and complete what is perhaps the most important task on my way to leaving this godforsaken place and flying all the way to China. She grins. She knows. I know. I know I won't be able to. My legs are far too weak. My head feels as if it's about to burst and split, much like lightning decimates a tree from the inside out. She smiles. She knows. She's anticipating this. I have to go. Maybe if I get away from here, maybe I'll be saved. He's going to go away soon. Are you sure you want to stay down and let him? She whispers in my ear. Her voice so gentle, yet the words she says so sad and cruel. Is she killing me somehow? I look at her and I notice. Her hair. It's so beautiful. It radiates impeccably bright rays of light, raining down my failing eyes. 
hurting me, but also arousing me. I feel so attracted to her. I must have her. I... I don't know what's happening with me. I must go. I clench my teeth as I attempt to stand up. Tina does not help me, but then again, she doesn't hinder me either. That metallic taste returns. I feel something warm spreading throughout my mouth. Confused, not yet understanding what's going on, I touch my lips and they're wet. Wet with my own blood. This is true terror. I, I must continue writing this diary, for there is something that compels me. I tremble, teeth rubbing against each other. Soon enough, one of them gets loose and falls, tumbling, touching the others and breaking them to dust. What has become of me? I am so, so tired. I feel like I should sleep. 14th of October, 2019. It's Monday today. I have to go to work. But I just can't. I just vomited. It was all stomach acid. Blood and lymph and all my teeth were what's left of them. I cannot talk. My body feels incredibly weak and brittle, as if bones were made of paper and muscle is nothing but mud bleached and put together by marrow and glue. And the pain is far too strong to move or even think. As I'm writing this, I lose my fingernails one by one, leaving bloody traces on my laptop keyboard. Why am I even doing this? Why am I dying? Tina is here. She's put one of her gorgeous summer dresses on. Her legs. I don't remember them ever being this long and silky. My eyes can't help but be drawn to her curves, my heart pulsating with the very movement of the scarce fabric covering her silhouette. She sports high heels, making her tower above me, casting down a shadow of both insane beauty and deep hatred. Oh, I really want her. She sits next to me. My chest is shaking. The exaltation pressing piercing pain out of each and every inch of my skin. My dear Sam. She runs her hand through my hair. You know you mean the world to me, don't you? I trace the hundreds of hairs fluttering in the air, dancing their last tango with a draught at home. I feel the sharp coldness on my scalp, now bald and dry. However, I feel calm. I have my wonderful Tina with me. I am going to die a happy man. No, please, just just let me live. Oh, sweetheart, you know that just won't do. 17th of October, 2019. I could not make a diary entry yesterday, the day before. All my fingers broke. I struggle to breathe. I think this is the end. But I am happy, for I have Tina here with me. She's getting more and more beautiful with each passing day. I so crave her. And I so hate her. It seems a demon lurks in that angelic body of hers. And my, she is wearing nothing but lingerie today. She tempts me. Her body is tanned and toned to cruel perfection. Her figure more feminine and exciting than any other woman who ever walked the world. I want her so much. If I could, oh, the things I would do to her, but... I can't. It hurts. Everything. I just wish I could sleep with her one last time. 
before I fall asleep one last time. 19th October 2019 Please, if you read this, make sure you don't look at my beautiful Tina. She is all mine. I am all hers. Make sure you close your eyes and be swift when you kill her. So there you go, another one from the vault. A fantastic story. Share with me so I could read it for you and hope you enjoyed it. Now, um, I am resurrecting my second channel in some style at the moment. If you're not familiar with it, then go check it out. Um, links in the description below. Putting a lot more shorter stories over on the second channel. Uh, things seem to be going pretty well now. Um, I did the uh, Dark Web Fixer story continuation last night. And there'll be something again tomorrow night, so... If you're not going over there and checking things out, you're missing a lot of stuff from me right now. <laughs> well, maybe I'm just doing too many stories for you, and three a week is enough. Well, that's fair enough, isn't it? Well, I will be back tomorrow night over on the other channel and back here on Friday. But until then, just time for me to say sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so... Come check me out, okay? <laughs>